dream about spiders. I, I don't know why I didn't watch like some creepy spider movie or something like that, but spiders were in my, my head. You know, there's a verse in the Bible that talks about how uh, people, many people, their, their plans and their designs are like the web of a spider, all intricately woven, but they won't hold you up or sustain you. They'll crash right through them. Only Jesus Christ, God's provision for our salvation, is able to sustain us. Our opening hymn today is Come, Let Us Join Our Cheerful Songs, and we will stand on the last verse. Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you and justly deserved your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them and sincerely repent of them. And I pray to you of your boundless mercy and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings of death your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor, sinful being. Upon this, your confession, I divert you of my office as a call and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in this setting, by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
O oh God, your almighty power is made known in showing mercy. Grant us the fullness of your grace that we may be called to repentance and made partakers of your heavenly treasures. This we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading is taken from Ezekiel chapter 2. And he said to me, Son of man, stand on your feet and I will speak with you. And he spoke to me. The Spirit entered into me and set me on my feet. And I heard him speaking to me. And he said to me, Son of man, I send you to the people of Israel, to nations of rebels who have rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me to this very day. The descendants also are impotent and stubborn and sent you to them, and you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord God, and whether they hear or refuse to hear, for they are a rebellious house, they will know that a prophet has been among them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle lesson is taken from 2 Corinthians. I must go on boasting. Though there is nothing to be gained by it, I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told which man may not utter. On behalf of this man, I will boast, but on my own behalf, I will not boast, except of my weaknesses. Though if I should wish to boast, I would not be a fool, for I would be speaking the truth, but I refrain from it, so that no one may think more of me than he sees in me or hears from me. So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, and it sh that it should leave me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you please rise for the verse and remain standing for the reading of the gospel. <laughs> Gospel according to St. Mark, the sixth chapter. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. He went away from there and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, son of Mary? the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon, and are not his sisters here with him? Well, and they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own household. And he could do no mighty work there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went about among the villages teaching. 
And he called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He charged them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. And he said to them, Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. And if any place will not receive you and they will not listen to you, when you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that people should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated for the hymn. and mercy and peace to each one of you from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. My text is the gospel lesson today from Mark chapter 6. Well every time I preach through the gospel of Mark I have to tell this story so if you've heard this before uh, please please be patient with me I'm sorry but there's the story about the family that had a parrot and they taught the parrot how to answer the door so when someone would come to the door the parrot would say who is it 
Well, one day they weren't home, and the plumber came around to the back door, and he knocked on the door, and the parrot said, Who is it? He said, It's the plumber. Who is it? It's the plumber. Who is it? It's the plumber. Who is it? It's the plumber. It's the plumber. And he got so frustrated, he had a heart attack, and he died right there on the back porch. And the family came home, and they went around to the back, and there's this man laying dead by their back door. And they said, oh, who is it? And the parrot said, it's the plumber. <laughs> you heard me say a couple of weeks ago when we were looking at the story about Jesus in the boat calming the storm. After he calmed the storm, the disciples looked and said, who is this? Who is this that controls the, the sea and the wind? Uh, and the whole story of the Gospel of Mark revolves around this question. Who is this? It's a fascinating way to study the Gospel of Mark as a whole instead of all fragmented. But part of what Mark is doing is bringing us to this realization that who is this? This is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And if this is the Christ of the Son of the living God, you can't just go, oh, that's nice. There's an obligation here, right, that we are to receive him. We are to believe him. And so it becomes inexcusable to do anything other than to repose faith in him. But our text today shows that that was not always the case and is not even to our day. The go this gospel lesson has two parts to it, verses 1 through 6 and verses 7 through 13. And both of those sections highlight something that there are going to be people who do not believe, and consequently they'll face doom because of that. All of us know people that we love who don't believe, right? How many of you sitting here have a child or a grandchild or a niece or a nephew, and you were there when they were baptized? But now there's no trace of Christ in their life by what you can observe whatsoever. Or you have a neighbor or a good friend or a coworker, someone that you really like, wonderful, nice people. But you invite them to church and they don't come. And you invite them and they don't come. And you invite them and they don't come. Or perhaps someone with whom you labored in the gospel side by side, someone who used to come to church regularly and they were part of it. And you sat by them and you loved them and they loved you and you worked together but maybe they heard something that set them off and they got mad, or maybe they fell into some kind of besetting sin and they just didn't want to give up that sin. And now when you look at their lives, there's no evidence that Christ plays any part in their life anymore. That hurts inside, doesn't it? When you look at those folks, don't you just say, why can't they see what I see? What happened that you just don't understand this anymore? Jesus is so loving and so gracious and so forgiving. How could you possibly reject him like that? But in our text today, we see that Jesus faced rejection. In fact, he faced it from his own people and his own family. And it points to the fact that the disciples would also face rejection. And one day the gospel mission would go forth and people to this day reject Jesus. Let's look at the first part, verses 1 through 6. Jesus left Galilee and goes south to his hometown of Nazareth. He teaches in the synagogue on the Sabbath, and it tells us that the people, when they heard him teaching, they were astonished. Now, this word for astonishment here, it's not the kind of astonishment that we would have. If, for example, you say it's time for the kids to go to bed, and they all go to bed without a fuss, and you're astonished. <laughs> it's not that. Or it's not like when the Cubs win a game, and you're astonished, right? <laughs> this is the kind of astonishment that connotes incredulity, like there's no way. This can't possibly be. When they ask their questions in our text, it's important to put the emphasis in the right place. They're not asking, where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? No, no, that this is what they're asking. Where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? You see the jealousy and the rivalry as they look at someone who grew up with them that they know intimately, and now they're upset. How can he be such a big shot? And so they ask, 
is not this the carpenter? And we know that trades in those days were looked down upon. So it, it's a way of saying he's someone of, of lowly profession. Is he not the son of Mary and the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon and are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at us, at him. Now, besides the fact that we know there's Jesus and then there's four brothers mentioned here and then sisters in the plural, so there have to be at least two. So we know Mary had seven kids. But the point is their familiarity with him, that they know him, and he has a low station in life. They call him Mary's son, which, by the way, is insulting, too, because normally you would say the father's name. This is Joseph's son, right? So it's unusual to say Mary's son. And doesn't that kind of hint then at the idea that they kind of know in this town that Mary and Joseph weren't married when Jesus came into being. So it had a questionable start. It's a way of getting a little jab in there, right? And so Jesus notes, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own household. We already know from previous passages in Mark, his own family tried to stop him. His family thought that he was crazy. And it is true. Doesn't this point out the fact that it's sometimes the hardest thing to do is minister to your own family. You can reach a lot of people with your gospel outreach, but it's really hard to help someone in your own family who's wrestling with the, the gospel and struggling. It's hard for the preacher, right? I stand up here, I stand at the pulpit and proclaim the word of God. I stand at the altar and I consecrate the elements that become the body and blood of Christ. But my, my family knows I'm also the same guy that left his dirty socks laying on the floor, right? So you don't listen. You don't listen to somebody like that. And so Jesus could do no mighty work there except for healing a few sick people. Well, to me, that's pretty mighty work. It's a, it's a pretty big thing. But it's a, it's a way of saying that, that Jesus couldn't do the things that he really wanted to do. He could, it's not that he couldn't do them because he was unable to do them. It's not that he couldn't do them because their lack of faith somehow was a barrier that stopped him but rather that their rejection of him made it inappropriate for him and his mission to show his power in the way that he wanted where he was being rejected. And so the text tells us that he marveled because of their unbelief. That word marveled, meaning that he, he was amazed. It's the kind of amazement that would make you say, look at something and just say, wow. My uh, wife, Dawn, she's a big fan of The Chosen. I'm kind of okay with it, but she really, really likes it. And there's a scene in The Chosen where the disciples are getting gathered around and they go to eat some bread. And one of the disciples tastes the bread and he said, this bread is stale. And so Jesus takes a piece of bread and bites it and he goes, wow. But you know what? If you want to see the wows in the Bible, the real wows, there are only two places in the Bible where that happens. The only two places where he's marveling, where he's um, totally amazed to the point where he could say wow. One is the faith of the centurion. Remember the centurion who had wanted his uh, servant healed and he believed? And Jesus looks at him and he says, wow, even in Israel I have not found such faith. The other place is the lack of faith of his own hometown, where he says, wow, I can't believe that they don't have faith that they have not received me. The second part of our text then is where Jesus sends out the disciples two by two. Um, now the idea here is that as they go out, they were not to take extra money or, or bread or anything like that, because wherever they go, that Jesus is implying that they're going to be received. Someone's going to take them in and they'll be, they'll be cared for. But also there's the idea here in our text that they should expect some not to receive them, that they won't be welcome everywhere. There will be people who won't listen to them. And so they were to take off their sandals and shake the dust off of their sandals. And why should they do that? It's a testimony that they will face judgment. You see, they represent Christ. And so if they represent Christ and they're rejected, then the people are rejecting Christ. And if you reject Christ, then you're rejecting God. And if you're rejecting God on the last day, the day of judgment, it's not going to be a very 
good day. And so that shaking of the, the dust off of their sandals, that's not a way of saying, I'm not going to have anything to do with you ever again. It's a testimony, right? It's a way of saying that the unholiness of what you're involved in is a, is, a, is a testimony against you. It's kind of like what happens in our Old Testament lesson that Paul read for us from Ezekiel, that the prophet is to say certain things, and then God says, well, whether they hear or refuse to hear, at least they'll know that a prophet has been among them. Sometimes God's testimony is so that people will have no excuse. And so if you have people to whom you have shared the gospel or planted seeds or tried to steer them towards faith in Christ and they reject Jesus, don't have nothing to do with them. <laughs> don't turn away from them. As long as they live to their very last breath, if God gives you an opportunity, keep inviting them to church. Keep telling them about the one who saved you from your sins as long as they live. But we know that there are going to be those who will reject Jesus. And sometimes those are going to be even family members or people that we love. We say, how can it be that someone would not believe? It amazed Jesus, and it should amaze us. Let me close by bringing up a very difficult question. I would not be surprised in the very least that every one of you here who is a Christian, at some point in your life, you have thought about or wondered this, this question. And I would not be surprised at all if every one of you who has wondered that question, if you've never in your life from any pastor you've ever heard preach, heard them address or talk about this. That someone we love might face eternal torment. And what will heaven be like if they're not there? Has that ever bothered you? To know that you might be in heaven someday, but somebody you really love won't be there with you? How then can it be perfect? How then can it be heaven? Now, there's a lot I could say about this question, more than I have time for now. But in God's economy, we see, first of all, that even something tragic like the rejection of Christ, he turns around for good. Why? Because the rejection that people would give to his disciples when they shared the gospel is prefiguring what's going to happen later on when the nation of Israel rejects the gospel. And because the nation of Israel rejected the gospel, guess what? That's why the gospel went out to you and me, whose ancestors were a bunch of barbaric Germans running around in the woods. But now we too share in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we see his own hometown and his family reject him. And that's what leads then to the mission of his disciples, to bring it to surrounding villages. It's the same, same idea as what's in the parable of the great banquet. Remember, the king gives a banquet and invites people, and all the people say, oh, we can't come, we're too busy. And so the, the, the king says to his servants, go out then to the highways and the byways and find other people and bring them in. Or Paul's discussion in Romans about the grafted branches. Because they have rejected him, God has cut them off, and God has grafted us, the Gentiles, into place. So because there were people who did not believe, that's why the message has come to us. So we see that this is part of God's great plan. But most of all, the rejection that we see here is also foreshadowing the fact that Christ himself will be rejected to the point where at the end of the book of Mark, it will lead to his crucifixion and death. Now talk about a bad outcome. What a, what a more horrible thing that our leader, that the one who is heading up this movement, who has all these great powers, that he's going to be killed. But that's from our earthly perspective, because we know now that no greater outcome could have come to pass. It was on the cross that Satan was defeated. It was on the cross that sin is forgiven. It was on the cross that hell no longer is our inevitable destiny. And so the rejection which led to the cross becomes the focal point of all history. So what we're seeing here is that God takes things that look really horrible to us and he turns them around into some way that in his great and marvelous plan we never could have dreamed or imagined it. 
So keep sharing the gospel with people who reject Jesus. If the door is open to you and you have a chance, keep inviting them to church as long as God gives you those opportunities. Don't give up on anybody until they breathe their very last breath. As Paul says, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach good news. But also don't despair thinking about someone you love who's departed this life rejecting Jesus. We know this. That God has said in his eternal kingdom there will be no tears, no sadness, no pain. It's not as though when you get to heaven, somebody's going to come up to you and say, hey, how do you like it up here? And you're going to say, oh, it's pretty nice. It would just be better if so and so were here. No, there is nothing that could make it better. Now, I don't know how that is. I don't know how God is going to work that out. The scripture tells us that God's ways are unsearchable and his ways are inscrutable, so we don't understand it. As Paul read in, in Corinthians, there are things being uttered that no man can, can say. They're so high above us. But somehow God is promising that in his kingdom all glory will belong to him forever and ever. And that includes you, that you will glorify him and not hold anything back because there will be nothing that will cause you pain, tears, or sorrow. And so we need to see that as well and recognize that his glory includes our giving him glory. Amen. I invite you to rise now and join in confessing what all Christians believe in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father of my and you sent your son Jesus Christ to take away both the guilt and the power of sin. And so you have shown us mercy. You have been our strength. You have been our shield. And we ask that you would help us, O oh Lord, to persevere in this faith and never to let it flag in zeal that we might one day share with you all and all of your people in this blessed heritage. Lord, in your mercy. And you have given us as a church a mission. You have told us to go out into all the world and make disciples. And so we pray, Lord, that you would help us each in our own individual roles to do that. We ask that you would send laborers into the harvest. We ask that you would raise up pastors, evangelists, teachers, missionaries, deaconesses, and others who will be in full-time service. But for each of us, Lord, whatever our vocations, Grant us eyes to recognize when the door is open and we can plant those seeds of your word. We pray, Lord, for the church all around the world and for our brothers and sisters of every language, tribe, and nation, that together, O oh Lord, we would be united in this service, that we would exercise our spiritual gifts and that we would not let things tear us apart or drag us down but that we would march, Lord, toward that great conquest and victory that we shall enjoy when we see you face to face. Lord, in your mercy. 
We pray, Lord, for our homes. We thank you, O oh God, for giving us Christian households. And we ask that, that mothers and fathers, husbands and wives will share with each other the great love by which you have received them in Christ. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would help children to be obedient and to honor their parents. And we ask that you would guard and protect them from all the lures and traps and snares of our culture and society, trying to draw them away from what is good and right in your eyes. Give us wisdom to recognize these things. Give us courage to battle against them and pour out abundant blessings on each of our homes. Lord, in your mercy. And Lord, we see how St. Paul had a thorn in the flesh. And so you told him that your grace would be sufficient for him. And so while Jesus healed sick people, Paul was left with that thorn. And we never know, Lord, what your plan and your purpose is for our suffering and for our infirmities. But we do know that you have invited us to bring them before you. And as a loving father, you hear us and you speak gently back to our spirits. And so, Lord, hear our prayers for those among us who are especially in need for our shut-ins, Carolyn and Jean and Irma and Ron, for those battling cancer, Lord Doris and Lena, Lee's sister, Michelle, for Pat, for Paul as he recovers from the procedures done on his skin, Lord, for those with other health concerns, for our sister Arlene, who is in terrible, terrible pain as they try to figure out what's the best thing they can do to, to help her. For our sister Amanda, Lord. For Stan and for Marv. For Gary, for Dick, for Janice, for Bernie's wife Rita facing a double bypass surgery. And Lord, for um, a neighbor of Dick, Judy, Hirsch, who's had three hip, oper hip operations and now has a severe infection and has dislocated <coughs> her hip. And Lord, these and all others that we name to you who are in need, look upon them, and grant them healing when and where you will, to the glory of Christ, to the furtherance of his kingdom, but to all, give us eyes to see that in Jesus Christ we shall receive the final victory and our sufferings one day will be no more. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. And Lord, we recognize that you satisfy us in life through Jesus Christ. And we have many salesmen in this world, O oh Lord, people selling ideologies and philosophies and religions, promises and and cures, and we ask, O oh Lord, that we would be able to receive only what comes from your hand, that we would not be lured to anything that would draw us away from you, but rather that we would find our fulfillment and our purpose by being part of your plan in Christ. The, these and all other things, Lord, that you know that we need, grant us then for the sake of this one who gave his life on the cross for us and rose again to give us the promise of victory and now lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. We'll now receive your offerings.
rise as we continue with our service of Holy Communion. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who together unites us as one in your body, the church. By his forgiveness we are reconciled, and through his spirit we are declared your children together as a family of faith. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing. same way also he took the cup when he had supped and after he had given thanks he gave it to them saying drink of it all of you this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is poured out for you and for many for the remission of all of your sins do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup we proclaim the lord's death until he comes Amen. Lord, Jesus. lord remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray our father lord in heaven Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Peace of the Lord be with you all.
thanks to the Lord for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. As we have been called, gathered, and enlightened through your spirit as your church, you've sustained and nourished us that we may live as your people in this present life, and at, at your time rejoice in life everlasting. Your grace is sufficient, and your forgiveness is assured. Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Please be seated for the closing hymn. <laughs> that you could be here and that we could worship together. May God's grace and peace abide with you and in your homes all this week. We do have a Sunday school today in about, what time is it? I guess in about 15 or 20 minutes or so, so you have time to grab some coffee and fellowship a little bit. Um, reminder that this coming Saturday is the car show, so things are going, I think, spectacularly for that, but we always need help. Where's Gail? Get would you raise your hand nice and high? Anybody that would like to help in any capacity, just a little bit or, or a lot, whatever you think you might be able to do, she'd be the, the person to, to check on that. Um, also, the Tijuana mission trip is coming up the end of this month. And so there's a website there if you'd like to make donations that are part of the bags that are distributed to families that, when we do VBS down there. Um, there's some things that, that we need. So you know, just like if you get, the kids' toothbrushes or something like that is a real great blessing. So we hope you'll look that up. And then a couple of weeks from today, my sermon is going to be really, really short because we're going to have a reception of new members. So any new members, if you've never formally come up for a reception, uh, please try to be here that Sunday, and we're going to do that. We're also going to install officers. So all officers, please try to be here that day. And then we'll do a sending ceremony for those of us that are going down to Tijuana. Okay, any announcements that I miss? Mike? Uh, tomorrow night at June. Oh, Center, yeah, thank you. And uh, Dr. Joseph Pazil will be giving a presentation on the brain about the wonders that how God created the human brain. Uh, it's uh, 1501 Deep Lake Road in Antioch. It's 
starts at 7 o'clock. Yeah, please see Mike or I if you have some, some questions. I, uh, those are always marvelous, so that will be a great event. Paul. If you're going on the Lake Geneva cruise, that's coming up real fast. If you haven't paid, just write a check to the church and then the memo line just for the cruise or Lake Geneva or something like that. Thank, thank you, Paul. Anything else? All right, then go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.